Oh, and we are recording. Hey, everybody, it's Erica Shepard, and you are joining us for Firestarter episode two. And I'm here today with Michael Leonard. Hello, Michael. Hello, Erica. <laughs> How are you doing today? Great. Excellent. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, as you guys are, might be familiar with, and even if you're not, Firestarter is a little mini interview series that I have cultivated to help people tell their stories on what has lit their fire in their lives. Their stories are all diverse and different, and it may not be what you expect. So today, Michael Leonard is here. Just a little bio on Michael. Um, Michael, after growing up in California and graduating from UCLA, he began a career in retail. He was eventually recruited by Belk from to Charlotte in 2007. In 2009, Michael switched career paths at Belk to focus on the development of new products for the home store. That switch from buying to developing, manufacturing, and sourcing took Michael to 26 different countries and has literally flown around the world more than a dozen times. I don't think all of us can say that, which is pretty cool. He then took a vice president position on the manufacturing side and found himself commuting to work in Florida. Last year, after seeing the growth in Charlotte and tired of living in two cities, don't blame you, Michael made another bold move, opening QC Signs and Graphics, which is Charlotte's best sign company, in case you were wondering. And then today, he has a story to tell you about himself and the outside forces that helped shape his life. So welcome, Michael Leonard. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Yeah, so Michael has a really unique story uh, that... I've kind of advertised on my inner fire tribe and that you were on the U S airways flight. Was it 1549? Yes. Miracle on the Hudson. The one that went to the Hudson. I, when I first heard you say that, it just shook me to my core because that is such an intense and unique experience. And I would love to hear you share more about that experience today because when it comes to, like near-death experiences, it can shape a lot around who we are and what we do in life. And a lot of us don't necessarily understand what it's like to be in that situation, which is one thing I love about telling story is that it gives us opportunity to hear somebody else's perspective. And so I would love for you to just start and tell us the story of what happened that day, you know, when you were on that plane. All right. Um, I was up in New York on a business trip. At the time, I was a buyer for Belk. Okay. I was actually buying women's clothing for a living. Oh, right. That makes perfect sense, right? <laughs> Your daughters will appreciate that someday. <laughs> um, and it was a routine flight. It was a 2.45 on a Thursday. Mm -hmm. It had snowed that morning. It was funny because I woke up in my hotel room. I was on the like 15th floor of a courtyard. Wow. And I looked outside and it was snowing. Yeah. So I said, I better put the Cole Hans on because they've got a better grip. For yes. the suit I'm wearing, I can wear you know, two choices of suits, two choices of, of shoes I bring to New York normally, so I don't have to check a bag, yeah. um, and, and pick the shoes that would grip better for the snow outside. Little did I know that it would clear. I mean, I, I realized it would clear up as the day went on, but we hopped on a U.S. Air, US Airways flight, flight 1549, yeah. um, so it's scheduled at 245, and typical LaGuardia fashion, it was delayed. <laughs> uh, I think yeah, I want to say at least more than half, hands down, at least half of all flights, shuttle flights back and forth from Charlotte to New York um, are delayed, I, I would argue. Yes. Uh, but it, Charlotte being the second biggest banking city in America, yeah. tons of flights, tons of people going back and forth from Charlotte to New York every day. Right. Um, I remember there was, I remember seeing the one, there was one baby on the flight. I made a comment to my boss at the time about what a, what a total jerk I am when I travel with my kids. Yeah. My kids are first, and everyone else can get the hell out of the way. Yeah. I'm a business traveler. I'm the opposite. I'm like, I'm here on business. Get out of my way. Yes. Maybe I'm just not always the nicest traveler. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Or at least back then, I wasn't. Right. Um, yeah, so hopped in the flight. We stayed on the tarmac. Um, at three, basically at 326, we were cleared for takeoff. Yeah. Um, skies were sunny. It had heated up to maybe the 40s. You know, it was a beautiful day. Balmy 40. Um, and we took off. I was sitting there reading the USA Today back when people actually read papers. This was 2009. Yeah. So it was 11 years ago. Wow. Um, but we went up and I'm sitting there reading probably the entertainment section or something like that. Yeah. And 91 seconds up, uh, our 
A320, Airbus 320 aircraft ran smack into a flock of Canadian geese. Yeah. Canadian geese are 12, uh, eight to 12 pounds. They can have six to eight foot wingspans. They are massive birds. Right. Um, it's mid January. They should have flown south already. already. <laughs> oh, clim climate change is happening, isn't it? They're sure. flying south later. Yeah. They were delicious um, too. But we had no communication from the flight attendants, from the crew. There were three flight staff, two in the front, one in the back. Wow. All three were strapped in. Yeah. Uh, captain Chesley Sullenberger, Sully, was captaining, and Jeff Skiles was actually the co-pilot who took us up into the air and ran into the geese. Yeah. Um, kind of a funny, maybe a little too soon story was the uh, first time I met Jeff Skiles two weeks after the incident. Shook his hand, told him was grateful to meet him, and asked him, next time, would you watch out for the geese when you're flying? <laughs> right, right. You know, just so I had a little sense of humor about it. I hear you. Um, but so we're 91 seconds up. I'm reading the paper, and what I can best describe as combat boots in a clothing dryer. Uh -huh. So thud, thud, boom, boom, as we ran smack into what we didn't know at the time was geese. Yeah. And I, I, I realized we had lost an engine, I didn't realize we had lost both. A woman behind me, three rows back, who I knew, Laura, screamed as when she heard this noise and everything was going on. I was like, it, it, be quiet, it's okay. We lost an engine, we're going back to LaGuardia. Mm -hmm. um, I had, the first time I, the, well, the first and probably only time I flew an aircraft, I was 13. <laughs> I did a mentorship with a retired Air Force pilot back in the day. My brother is a retired colonel in the Air Force. I've been on plenty of aircraft. I know airplanes, I know any commercial jet can fly on, on, on one engine. So I wasn't too worried about it. I was more worried about getting home late. Yeah. Again, there's no, so we're 91 seconds in. The flight crew entirely were in their seats. Yeah. Um, Doreen, I believe, in the back of the plane, never realized we actually hit, didn't even know we are landing in water. Wow. Along with a lot of passengers on the plane. Yeah. Um, so as, as we hit, as we hear this noise, as things go quiet, again, I thought we were okay at first. And then pouring through the cabin, like down the aisle, was a smell of jet fuel and burning flesh. Oh, and it was pungent. Yeah. And it was strong. And we didn't know what was going on. Right. So I, I'm looking out the window. I'm, I'm in seat 12C. Um, in this configuration of the aircraft, rows 10 and 11 are emergency exits over the wing. Right. So I'm one behind there. Wow. I keep looking out to my left, looking at my left, looking at what's going on. And I see us turning at first. Okay, I guess we're going to like LaGuardia. Well, we turned, but then Manhattan's to my left. Mm -hmm. We've gone over the George Washington Bridge. And I'm like, okay, I guess we're going to Newark? Because that's down the water there a ways, right? Oh, we'll get there. Um, and we got lower and lower and lower. And we had zero communication from anyone. Yeah. Um, this is 91 seconds in. The entire flight was five minutes. Wow. Um, so we keep getting low, and I'm looking to my left, and I say to the woman next to me, we're going in the drink. Because I realized we were so low. Newark was further south. I'd flown into these airports multiple times before. There's nowhere you can be landing but the water. Right. And it was just after that where Captain Sully came on. Yeah. And he said to us, this is your captain, brace for impact. The way he said it was with total confidence. Mm -hmm. He had no fear in his voice at all. Mm -hmm. It never crossed my mind that I could die. Yeah. It never crossed my mind that yeah, we would something bad, terrible. I sat there thinking, all right, we're going to the water. And two thoughts went through my mind. Number one is, where's the plane going to crack? Because I'm going to have to swim. Yeah. And it's cold out there, and I'm not a great swimmer, but all right, I got to swim. Yeah. Number two is I, I wonder who's going to die. Again, never crossed my mind that I could die. Right. Didn't even have thought in my mind. Yeah. Um, so we're heading down and going and going, and again, we're looking at Manhattan. And, yeah. and when, when Sully said the words, this is your captain, brace for impact. Yeah. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> I had no idea in the world. Right. I'm, look, I'm looking around. Other passengers looking around. We don't know what to do. Right. I'm wearing glasses. I've worn glasses for 25 years. 
Right. I put my arms up in front. This is a US Airways flight, right? So yeah. you kind of bang into the seat in front of you. There's no room to put your head down, to put it in your lap, to, uh, I don't know. I cross my hands in front of me. And again, I'm trying to look left, look at the skyline, look at where we are, look at us coming down, look in, look in. When are we going to hit? When are we going to hit? When are we going to hit? Yeah. Eventually, we hit the water, slam. I slam my head up, then break my glasses, blood all running down my face. And the plane comes to the fastest stop you've ever been in. I've ever been in. Most people yeah. have ever been in. Um, going down, the plane hit tail end first. And the tail end of the aircraft, the under piece of the fuselage was ripped off the aircraft. Yeah. So you got a plane coming down. Yeah. And I was in the middle of the aircraft. Right. So fortunately for me, at least, I had one of the better experiences. Yeah. The people in first class just kind of, well, they were good. The people in the back, water starts rushing in dramatically. Wow. You're in the back row and we're actually able to put your head down. Water came up and over your head. Wow. Ice cold, frigid water that you will die in. Guaranteed death in 18 minutes. 18, 19 minutes, they said. Wow. Um, water is so cold. There's ice in the water that morning in the Hudson River. Right. Um, we go, and the way that the aircraft goes down, not only does the back rip off, but the left engine rips off. And the entire airplane turns based on the weight of the, of, the of the engines and faces Manhattan. And that's the iconic photo so many people have seen. Right. The plane comes, hits, slams down, and it's facing Manhattan. Right. And right then, I've talked to many passengers, it's just split second. It's a, it's a millisecond, whatever it is. Yeah. Where we stopped. For many people, it's like we didn't break apart. For me, it, for me it's we didn't break apart. Let's get out of here. Yeah. And there's a second, and it'll, it's, it's in black and white in my mind. And I'll never forget just, we're, we're all here. We're all stopped. What, get out. Go, go, go. And I start yeah. screaming, go. So yeah. I'm one behind the emergency exit on the aisle. Um, I flip around. And row 11, they'd actually followed the instructions. They had taken the door and put it in the seat and had exited towards out onto the wings. Yeah. Well, the time I turned the corner, instantly the door falls right down in front of me. Yeah. So I'm annoyed as, as all could be. But what? Dang door. I yeah. pick up the door thinking I'm going to be throwing it outside. Yeah. But I see my boss, my yeah. boss Lori at the time. I said, oh, don't throw it. I'll set it on seat where it was originally. And we need flotation devices. Yeah. Because if you look at, again, look at most of the early photos, not right. a single person put a vest on. Wow. We, such a 91 seconds up, three and a half minutes down, five minute flight. Right. Longest flight I've ever been on. <laughs> <laughs> right, I bet. And I, and I flow in 15 hour flights to China and other places, India and other places. So yeah. longest flight I've ever been on. Right. Um, but I went and reached into row 10, 10 B and C and grabbed two seat cushions. Mm -hmm. I was all right, one for me, one for Lori, the boss. Mm -hmm. I go to get out of the plane and put my arm and reach it out. And someone on the wing just grabs it. I'm annoyed. Like, well, what are you doing grabbing? That's for my boss. What? Right. Well, of course they did. I'm handing a seat cushion, a flotation device, out the door. Of course they grabbed it. Right. I turn back thinking I'll grab another one and realize there's only about four people on that wing, five people on the wing. There's a whole plane of people, 100 but all trying to get out. All right, I'll share my seat cushion, I figure. Yeah. So go out on the wing, and I end up second to the end at this point on the wing. Um, my boss had, so my boss is 6'1". Yeah. She had a full down coat, down past her knees. She had knee-high, heavy boots on. Yeah. And she had gone out on the wing and jumped in the water. Wow. So the only thing she could grab onto was the actual door from row 10, because 11 was still on the plane, but row 10, the door had gone out. Yeah. Doors, they might float, but they aren't gonna hold you up. Right. So Lori was struggling to keep her head above water. It's freezing, absolutely frigid water. Um, she sees me on the wing and starts screaming my name. I go out way near the edge of the wing, and I'm actually, I'm trying to get to her. How do I get to her without slipping off this wing myself? Because obviously it's wet. Right. I'm on a wing of an aircraft that has a slight tilt to it. Right. I'm actually able to take my left hand and wedge it under the front flap of the wing. Take my right hand, and on the back, on an Airbus apparently, there are two straps that go on the back of a seat cushion. Right. I'm able to lay my hand underneath the strap and reach it out to her for her to grab it. Wow. She slides her hand underneath, and I pull her up on the wing. Wow. 
at this point, I think I'm good. Again, didn't, I wasn't going to die. I was like, wow, the sky looks really beautiful. Let me take a picture of that. Right. So I grabbed my Motorola flip phone <laughs> and I take back a picture the of the sky. Yeah, back in the day. Picture yeah. of the sky. I take a picture of my coworker, Lisa. Lisa's not looking so good. She's in what she thought was a raft, was really a upside down slide that had flipped over. Yeah. And she's on that trying to stabilize it going. Um, I, I take a picture of Lori, my boss, who's frigid, cold, and standing there. And Right. Of course, she later makes me delete that photo. <laughs> right. um, but so I'm standing there, and then I hear, and again, it's not really past crossing my mind, like, what's going on, why this is happening, what's happening. But then I, I hear people, things kind of calm down for a second while I'm taking my pictures. But then I start hearing screams and shrieks. And there's a woman who had jumped in on the front of the wing, I'm near the, you know, and had come back and swum back because they realized they weren't going to make it to shore. And starts screaming, I can't feel my legs. I can't feel my legs. I'm going to die. Jesus save me. Jesus save me. I'm going to die. Yeah. I, I look at a woman who I recognized, of all things. I'd actually seen her in a showroom two days earlier. Wow. Um, she was a buyer for Hamricks out in, down in Gaffney. Yeah. And her and I kind of look at each other like, let's get, I didn't know the woman at the time, but Amy Jolly and I pull Shay out of the water. And Shay, again, I did not know. She was also a buyer at Hamricks. And Shay, we got her out of the water. She couldn't stand. She could, literally couldn't feel her legs. She'd been in that water 30, 40 seconds maybe, already right. going numb. So I go and I'm trying to rub her legs. Like, all right, get, you got to stand. You got to stand. You gotta, if we're going to get rescued, you got to be able to get out of here. So I'm rubbing her, grabbing her. She stands up. She can't feel her hands. I'm rubbing her hands. She's screaming for Jesus to save her. I'm rubbing her hands. I'm not even a religious guy, but I'm like, Jesus is going to save you. He's going to save you. Cause I'm just trying to calm her down. At that moment, I look to my right and I see a ferry. So we hit at 3:31 PM and captain Sully put this plane down right near the docks, right near the boats on purpose. He landed exactly where he did for a reason. Wow. And I see a vessel, which ended being the Weehawken ferry. The Alexander Hamilton picked me up eventually. Um, when I see that, that ferry coming and I see my screaming woman who's going to die, who wants Jesus to save her, right then and there, I made a commitment myself about when I'm going to leave. And there's a thought that went through my mind that helped me make that commitment. Yeah. As I'm sitting here telling her she's going to live, she's going to be okay. I I'm not even sure at this point what's going on. I'm just reassuring her. I see that boat and all I can think of is an episode of Seinfeld. So I'm dating myself. But there's an episode. Do you know who George Costanza is? Oh, yes. All right. So there's an episode where George Costanza, I'm not sure if he starts the fire or the fire starts. It's in an apartment in New York. He's in the kitchen. There's a clown. There's a lady in a walker. It's like a seven-year-old's birthday party. So George Costanza realizes the fire is going on. So not only did George push the clown out of the way, the kid's out of the way, he knocks the old lady with a walker out of the way. And he's the first one out of that apartment. Right. So for some reason that went through my mind. Don't be a Costanza. I saw oh, yeah. the ferry coming and all I wanted to do is get I'm like, nope, nope, nope. My goal then was my Jesus lady, as I was calling her at the time. Yeah. When I get Jesus lady out of here and I get my boss out of here, I'm out of here. Right. So that was my plan when I saw the ferries. Yeah. Um, as the ferries coming towards us, one of I believe it was 13 different vessels that picked us up, something like that. It was ridiculous. Vessels came from every direction, both private and public. Um, and I, I look at the end of the wing, and there was a gentleman who looked, you know, balding, older, big guy, but he had blood down the side of his, front of his face, as long as I did. I didn't even know at the time. And he looked more like a gladiator or something to me. He kind of looks at me, we kind of nod, and realize, all right, we need to help these people up. We need to help people panicking. We need help freaking out. Yeah. I'm like, I can help Jesus lady. I can get the boss up. And then I can get out of here. So we get my boss up. We help a couple of people. There was a woman, Eileen, who I worked with. She was a vice president at the time. I was a buyer. So I'm trying to grab her. And so, so it's a Weehawken ferry that comes. Weehawken ferry, it's probably eight, 10 feet up from where we are is where the deck of the ship is. So in order to get up there, yeah. they throw over this very heavy, thick mesh, like plastic safety 
curtain, I almost want to call it. Yeah. But, it, but it's a net. So what Pastor had to do was kind of grab on, grab a, go up a couple, one, two rings maybe, and the deck hands could literally would throw you up on the deck. Um, so we get Lori up, we get another one up, we get Eileen up, and Eileen is a woman who's vice president, very attractive woman who I know very well now, didn't know so well then. I'm yeah. trying to push her up, and I can't, I, I, I grab her leg, I'm like, I'm not really, but I don't want to put my hand on her butt. <laughs> She's a vice president of my company, and I don't want to have a sexual harassment charge. Right. No, no um, plane crash or not. I'm going to be yeah, my. Yeah, yeah. She, she sends that I can touch it anytime I want. I haven't done it, but you know. Um, but I helped Eileen get up there. Sure. <coughs> Shay, the woman, Jesus lady, still wasn't up. And we had helped, I want to say, three or four people up. And the wing we're on is floating. The entire aircraft is going three to four miles an hour down the Hudson River. The ferry boats are adjusting and, and trying to go with us and get there so they can rescue people. Right. Well, the ferry captain overcorrected a little or the plane slowed or whatever happened. Yeah. But here's our wing. Here's a ferry boat up like that over the wing. So I had two choices. I can either grab onto that mesh thing. And this is what I thought I was going to do. I was going to grab the mesh thing. And then once he's back down, I was going to jump back on the wing. Because I had to get my lady, because that was a pact I had with myself. I cannot leave until Jesus' lady is safe. That was it. Yeah. So, but as soon as I grab onto it, I could either grab onto it or I could fall into the water. I had two choices. I wasn't falling into the water. Right. So I grab on, deck hands grab me and literally throw me up onto the, um, onto the, the deck of, the, of Alexander Hamilton, the ship. Yeah. Um, I get off the ground and try and go back. I, I, I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know. But turn to go back. Guy's like, inside. He screams at me. Right. I, I listen. I, I, yeah. Guy's okay. Go inside. Yeah. It's go time. Um, I, I, it never really, it, the whole thing is, is fuzzy. I actually had, at the time, my wife, I had called her from the wing. I forgot about that part. Um, when I first landed, I'd taken the pictures. That's when I actually called my wife. 3.31 p.m. It was a 2.45 flight. She answers the phone at home. So you're going to be late. I respond, no, land in the water. Uh, I'm on the wing. We're sinking. I got to go by. I'm sh Not the best choice of words. No. Um, later in on the wing, when I'm actually helping someone up, I remember my phone rings. It's in my chest pocket. I pull out the flip phone. I say, rescuing people can't talk. Bye. Uh-huh. I remember the phrase. I don't remember putting the story there, but. Um, yeah, it's it, the entire from plane leaving LaGuardia to everyone rescued was less than 20 minutes. Wow. It was a really small, short event when it comes down to it that, and it changed my life in many ways. So, oh, uh, so thank you for sharing that. And I would love to hear where, in what ways did that 20 minutes, I mean, really change your life? For me, well, it didn't hit me until the following Monday. It yeah. happened on Thursday and the following Monday. And I, I think that's important to say because, like, as to, to the uh, viewers out there, you were saying this whole time you didn't think you could die. It didn't even occur to you that you could die. And now something's hitting you the next Monday. Yeah, it wasn't even, it didn't hit me. It was uh, my company had brought in a counselor. There were okay. six of us from my company on the plane. Right. And we sat down in a room, got pulled the counsel. I'm like, oh, okay, this will be fine. Now, given I had been obsessed with the plane and everything that happened, and that's all I could think about, and that's all I did for, you know, four days prior to that. Um, but I sit down in the room, and there's five women I work with. And each one of them told their story. And each one of them thought they were going to die. Uh, uh, cry, I'm crying like a baby. Oh, my God, you went through that. How could you have? That's so terrible. Oh, my, like... My heart is just wrenching inside for these poor women who are my crash buddies. I call them now. Yeah. Um, and and it, it took me almost like at the end of the meeting, like, oh, oh yeah. When it came to me, I'm like, oh, I got to talk too. But I didn't go through what you went through. Right. Um, it took me that time period and then weeks and then months to really process it. And it changed my life in many ways. Yeah. And I think that's important what you just said there because – if this is a testament to how 
people can deal with trauma in different ways and how the reaction and the processing time can be different for different people. So like these women were already connected to their emotions and the experience and you're over there connecting to their experience, but disconnected from your own. Yeah. And that's just a, that's normal human processing time. Some people, the shock goes away different or, you know, there's more processing in between that and your story fully headways that. And once you finally started to let the story settle in, what, what things were starting to shift in your life once things were really starting to hit you and you were starting to process it and integrate it? The thing that I guess I decided or figured out or, you know, what am I going to change? What am I going to do? What am I going to, was anything bad in my life? I want to go on. Mm. Um, and that didn't, didn't necessarily mean my bad habits, just things I didn't like, things I didn't want, things I, yeah. um, I ended up moving out for my wife and lived outside the house for a year. Right. Uh, cause our marriage was, was terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately that year out didn't actually save it, but it gave it more time at least. Sure. Um, I decided that I didn't want to just be a buyer my whole life. I said, what do I want to do when I grow up? And I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Yeah. And at that point, um, I was 37. Mm -hmm. I'd been a buyer for almost 10, 15 years, 15 years almost. Wow. And I traveled all over the U.S. And I know New York by the back of my hand. I know it better than any town. I know it way better than Charlotte. And I live in Charlotte. Right. Um, I, I would go to fashion shows in LA, I go to Chicago trade shows, I go, I go all over the place in the US. Yeah. I'd had a brief stint where I'd done some international sourcing and been to Taipei and Shanghai and other places. And I said, you know, that's what I really want to do. I want to see the world and get paid for it. Yeah. So I made a career move within my own company and went from a buying position to in a department store was a product development position, developing products for the home store. Yeah. Um, I had been at Belk at the time, two years, I spent the next eight, um, in product development and five of those over the entire home store, managing a nine figure business for the Belk company, um, developing, designing more than, I want to say it was eight different brands, um, Mm -hmm. and and just, and traveling the world and, and doing something totally different. I mean, I, I spent my 40th birthday hiking the Great Wall of China and then biking through the Hutongs and the uh, Forbidden City and Temple of Heaven. Yeah. I, I've been to Siem Reap, Cambodia on a stopover for 23 and a half hours. I went to Angkor Wat. I've been all over Europe and I've done all kinds of really amazing things. And sure, I was working. Right. Um, but it's Saturday afternoon and I'm working trench shopping on Las Ramblas in Barcelona and we're stopping for tapas and sangria. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. So it, was, it definitely changed my life as far as get rid of everything bad in my life. Yeah. You know, what do I want to do when I grow up? And that was, the, for me, the biggest thing. Um, the other biggest thing is really the relationships and the people I met. Yeah. Through our 20 minutes of fame. Uh, my crash buddies, as I call them. I've actually got a banner behind me, Miracle on the Hudson, Celebration oh, of Life. There it is. That's a banner I made for this year's Celebration of Life party up in, up in Midtown Manhattan. Is that something you guys do every year? You do a celebration of life? Yeah, one of the um, more financially set individuals within, on the plane crash, CEO of a, was, was CEO of the world's largest home textile company, here, the U.S. CEO, um, now retired. But he hosts a party for the last 11 years up in Midtown. And uh, he invites first responders. I actually spent this last January hanging out with Patrick, who was the air traffic controller. Hanging out with Scott Cohen, the first, the first captain to get there, with Vince Lombardi, one of the other captains to get there. Um, and we have a party every year up in New York and just celebrate our stories together, our life together. And I've got a, I call my crash buddies, crash buddies, most people call it the 1549 family. Yeah, that's incredible. I love that you guys have a celebration of life party every year. And I think I'm going to start that jam in my life. <laughs> That we just have more celebrations of life and focusing on that joy and that celebration and that, you know, people can say, oh my God, that's so horrible. You were in that experience. (laughs) But do you think it was a horrible experience? It's funny. I've given a number of speeches. I've done Toastmasters and Rotary and other things. And the last time I gave it, you know, it's one of the, yeah, my children being born is pretty awesome. This is kind of up there, honestly. It's, 
now would be totally different if anyone had died. It would have been totally different. It wouldn't be a miracle on the Hudson if everyone didn't survive. Right. If the crew didn't do their job correctly. Captain Sully walked up and down the aisle, neck high in water, twice. And had to yell that by his co-pilot, Skiles, to get off the plane. Sully was making sure that plane was clear. Yeah. The first responders came from everywhere. The people yeah. reacted. The, it, it gave me really good hope and faith in what, when things can go right, despite everything going wrong. Yes. Everything went right that day. And yeah. It was truly amazing and truly a powerful, wonderful, I'm, I truly feel blessed that I was part of that experience. I've been a, a friends that will be lifelong friends with me. Wow. Um, and, and it's a heck of a story to tell too. It is a heck of a story to tell. And I am so honored that you were sharing it with us today. With this experience, what do you feel was the greatest fire started in your life? What, what was the greatest fire that was ignited from the situation in your life, do you, do you think? I, I never would have started a business last year if it wasn't for that. It's basically forget, I use another word, but forget fear. I use the other one normally, but you know, we're being yeah. recorded. We know what you're um, talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> like it doesn't, try stuff. Do stuff you, you wouldn't normally do. Try new things. Forget fear. Forget what could go wrong because I could be dead. Um, so it's one of those things where I changed career paths and did something totally different outside my comfort zone, but I knew I really wanted to. Um, again, lad, over, about a year ago, I started a new business, which is something I never would have done if that hadn't happened to me. Um, I never would have had the, the courage because um, it's scary as hell starting a business. Oh, but yeah. I've heard. Oh. Hello, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I totally resonate with that. And a lot of people know my story and I'm going to be talking more publicly about it. But it was the events the, that my life kind of seemingly falling apart three years ago that led to me being with my business and being an entrepreneur and inner fire wellness. And if that had not happened, I guarantee you, I would not absolutely not be where I'm at today. Yeah. And so people are like, oh my God, that story, it sucks. And I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's not like <laughs> I would welcome that to happen again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll pass on plane crashes. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, I, I, I got my badge and yeah, it's like, you're like, I, I got my, I survived a plane crash. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> but you turned that trauma that, that story and again lighting the fire it sounds like a lot of people on that plane did too yeah it's it, all of us truly feel it being the not everyone there's people who disappeared never saw again never met knew sure. it. um but we've had reunions early on reunions with 50 to 70 people there wow uh, we, we had the privilege because sully is truly truly an american hero um in uh, what do you say? Oprah had like people of the decade, and Sully was one of them, of course. Man, I'll tell you, and, that's and, impressive. And what Oprah did was fly out any passenger who wanted to come. And so I got to go hang out with eighty of my crash buddies in Chicago for a weekend on Oprah. Uh, really cool stuff happened. Okay, know? like oh, meeting Oprah <laughs> is like goals over it's here. Cool. I got I, back in this being back in the day, but I got an iPod and I got gift cards. She gave me all kinds of stuff. And it was like, oh, there's Oprah. I didn't actually get to shake her hand, but she was right next to me. Like, there's Oprah right next to me. Cool. <laughs> Oprah. Oh, my gosh. Seriously. So you got an iPod from Oprah? Yeah, she gave me. I still have it. Still, my kids still have it. Oprah yeah. is the queen of gifts, man. I tell you. I love it. That is fantastic. Yeah, you would not have met Oprah if it wasn't for this. I wouldn't have met Clint Eastwood either. Clint Eastwood, although I don't agree with him politically. Sure. He's one of my all-time favorite actors and directors. The and he cast. directed the Sully movie that we all got to be in the last scene of. So uh, that was pretty cool meeting. meeting uh, I Chris haven't with watched it yet. And so now, oh. okay, which is ridiculous because I have been putting it off. And I think the reason I put it off is so now when I see it, I'll be like, I know that guy. <laughs> yeah, well, like, yeah. So we get away till the end when the credits are rolling. And then the, yeah, we have a reunion with us, the real passengers and Sully and the crew. And I made sure I got right, you know, I'm, I'm close to Sully. As you should be, absolutely. So I had, I, 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 
Yeah, the day of the film, they actually sat and had lunch with him, and he was telling us all about the filming. He had a fake mustache on because he had shaved it. Um, but it was interesting because he actually was in the cockpit with Clint Eastwood, like Clint Eastwood and the crew doing the filming of it to make sure everything was accurate as possible. Wow. Yeah, so it's pretty neat. Dang. Well, now I can watch with confidence. You know, that movie for me, I worked for U.S. Airways in college. That was my part-time job. Yes. Yeah. Right. So when this happened, I just, I constantly fly in U.S. Airways because when you work for an airline, you fly for free. Life hack, by the way, for anybody who's listening out there, work for an airline. Um, I, when that happened, I mean, it just, all kinds of emotions, so emotional about it because I'm like, well, gosh, what if that was me, you know? And you know, just picturing the, those few minutes where that's going down. I mean, for you, like you said, it was like this didn't even occur to you that would die, but I probably would have been one of those women that's like, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know? yeah. And uh, luckily wouldn't have been, uh, you know, wouldn't have died. I would be alive, but man, that's, you just being in that spot where you don't know, like you said, now you can really celebrate life because you know what it's like to possibly have that taken away from you. Yeah. Exactly. To, to exactly. really so, feel that. Decide that when you watch it, there's a fairy captain, Vince Lombardi, no relation to the football Vince Lombardi, okay. but he's the only one in the entire, the entire film that plays himself. They pulled the actor because Vince was telling Clint Eastwood how the guy was doing things wrong. Clint Eastwood looked at him and said, do you want to be yourself in this? He said, yeah. <laughs> so, Hired. And I ended up hanging out with him in January the whole night. He was like my buddy. <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Well, um, first of all, we, I am personally glad that you are here and still part of the Earth Thank plane. You. And now we have Charlotte's best sign company, thanks to <laughs> Flight 1549. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It was, as I said before, it was a sign. I should open a company, right? It was a sign. You should open up yeah. a sign company. Let's, let's be 100% frank here. Is there any other nugget, as we're wrapping up the year today, is there any other nugget of wisdom that you, like, because of your experience, because of your life story and what has happened to you that you would want anybody to know that you're throwing this wisdom out into the universe? <laughs> I'm not sure it's so much wisdom, but life really is short. And that's one of the things that, I guess maybe the older I get as well or whatever, like, man, right. don't, don't say I'll do it tomorrow. Don't say plan it, make it happen. Like, just do it. Just I mean, it. Nike has a good saying for a reason, just do it, whatever, because you could be dead tomorrow. Right. Uh, you know, who cares? Just do it. Just do what your heart tells you. Um, that's one of the big things that really came out of that from me. Thank you. Preach it. Yes, absolutely. It doesn't mean <laughs> we don't take responsibility. It doesn't mean we don't take yes. ownership. It doesn't mean we don't take initiative. It means absolutely. start it, though. Start today. That number one regret of people who are dying, this is actually a hospice nurse who did this um, – yeah objective study and number one regret of dying people, people who obviously know they're dying. Uh, they said, I wish I would have chosen to be happier. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. Realizing you, you choose to be happier not every day, every day you do. Okay. And sometimes I having, life yeah. it's too late. I had a, I had a bad morning yesterday. I went and did something for the company. Yeah. And today I just flipped that around. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to make this customer who wants this, who wants the world for nothing. I'm going to try and make it happen and at least get a sale out of this. Right. Um, Cause instead of like looking down upon all the time I spent everything, I did, I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to make, we're going to make lemons or lemonade out of lemons kind of thing and just go with it. Yes. Lemonade out of lemons. I love that. Michael, I so appreciate you coming on today and Thank you. The little nuggets that I've gotten out of this are to F fear, <laughs> to ruin fear, uh, that we're going to celebrate life. I love, can you move this over to the celebration of life poster? Hold I on. love that. I want to show you. So that is me right there with my lady praying to be saved. With Jesus lady. Yep. My Jesus lady. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways. And then there's me. Uh, hold on to get to it. This is when everyone, this is like kind of the iconic photo. Right. This is, I had pulled my boss out of the water and I hadn't gotten up yet to start taking, I just started taking pictures. Oh, we lost you. Oh, crowd. I mean, I saw it. You, you showed all the pictures. Hello? Well, I think we lost Michael. <laughs> but Michael showed us that celebrating life and that we take 
life and live it to the fullest because it's too short is the message from his experience of surviving U.S. Airways Flight 1549. Hold on. I'm going to admit him back. Michael. Hello. You're back. It's okay. I was all saying, right. I was just coming edit, edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. You're, you're, we got all your photos. All right. So, yeah, so there's my little banner I made it for the reunion this year. I love it. That's all of us uh, with Sully at one of the first reunions at, with the museum and everything here in Charlotte. <sighs> so cool. That museum's cool. here in Charlotte. Yeah, museum in Charlotte. Unfortunately, it is closed right now. Okay. Um, they're renovating and redoing and adding a runway to the airport. It's at the airport. Wow. But um, I, I found it funny because at first I was like, why would someone want to go that? It's just a, they do a phenomenal job. I'm, I'm sure when they reopen, they'll do even a better job. They did a phenomenal job of telling the story and connecting you with the passengers. Yeah. Um, yeah. To share everyone's individual emotions and what happened that day. And it, it's very cool, actually. Uh, I'm definitely be checking that out. It was rated one of the top. I mean, the Charlotte Airport was rated the, sorry, the Carolinas Aviation Museum was rated one of the be top top ten best uh, airport or airplane museums in the world. Well, so everybody cool. listen to that Charlotte <laughs> Aviation. Although museum. it's closed for two years, they're reopening soon. But yeah, it will be again. <laughs> it will be once again one of the world's <laughs> top aviation museums right here in Charlotte, North Carolina, which I love. Yep. In the meantime, if you want to check out Michael and QC Sign the Graphics, which is Charlotte's best sign company, go check them out. Thank you. And uh, yeah, Michael, thank you so much again for sharing your story. Like I said, I was saying earlier, I should say that we are going to F beer, remind, remember that life is too short and to celebrate life and not have to, we don't have to wait for something traumatic like this to happen to celebrate life. Yep. And I, I love how people can go through things and share like, hey, why don't you just celebrate life now? And I'm like, instead of going through something like that, I'm just going to take your advice and do that. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Erica. I, I, I love your energy, your positivity, and I love your nose ring. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is awesome. part of life is too short for me. Exactly. I don't care that I'm, well, I was 31 at the time when I got it. And I'm like, I'll be 70 with this. <laughs> nice. I love it. Yes, exactly. Just live life. Just be you. Do your thing. Like, exactly. who cares? Like you said, who cares? Just do your thing. What makes your heart happy? Yep, exactly. Awesome. Well, I'm glad you're on that train uh, of awesomeness, my friend. And thank you once again. And if you guys have any questions for me or Michael, do not hesitate to leave a comment below and subscribe and follow as there will be more episodes to come. So thank you guys all today. And we'll see you next time on Firestarters. Cool. Awesome, Erica. Awesome. Thanks, Michael.